As Kenyans get ready to vote for president, questions are raised as to what they really want, change or continuity. But after the voters declare their verdict, can the winner deliver on promises to address Kenya's most urgent grievances? This is Inside Story. Garda. At least three policemen have been killed in pre-election violence on the final day of campaigning in Kenya. They were dispatched to try to prevent election violence when they came under attack by a mob accusing them of trying to rig the elections. The deaths came as the last days of campaigning for the Kenyan presidential elections drew to an end. It's been a close race between the two leading presidential candidates which consequently raised tensions across the country. Opinion polls show just a few points separating incumbent Mwai Kibaki and the opposition's Raila Odinga, with Odinga in the lead. Allegations of vote rigging are emerging even before a single ballot has been cast. The rising tribal rhetoric between candidate supporters has raised fears of unrest in the country. Since independence in 1963, Kenya has been a bastion of peace and stability in a very turbulent part of Africa. Well, let's look at the two most popular candidates. A wise old statesman or a man lacking the vitality to take his country to the next level? President Mwai Kibaki is seeking a second term in office. His slogan is, let the work continue. The 76-year-old is an economist and hopes that Kenyans will let him deliver another five years on Kenya's economic success story. The country currently boasts the largest economy in East Africa, but it's also one of the most corrupt. Critics round on Kibaki for not tackling Kenya's corruption, as he promised to do when he was elected in 2002. Now, the 62-year-old Raila Odinga poses the biggest threat to Kibaki's government. Like Kibaki, Odinga was educated abroad, and he, like his opponent, is one of Kenya's wealthy elite. But Odinga is campaigning as a champion of the poor. While promising to defend the underprivileged, he vows to bring change to the country and stamp out corruption in Kenya. Is he a man of empty promises or a new future for Kenya? Well, joining us now, our guest in Nairobi, Rachel Odengo. She's a senior correspondent at the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation in London, Topi Liambila. He's chief editor of the Kenyan London News. And in Oslo, Stephen Kabera Karanja. He's a senior researcher at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. Lady and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Ms. Odengo, if I could start off with you. Uh, we've heard of this violence. The three policemen have died recently. Things don't seem to be shaping up too well in terms of stability and safety in the build-up to the elections. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, there have been uh, a lot of cases reported on violence in Kenya resulting from, uh, I would call them propaganda rumors that uh, actually some people of the police force were meant to be involved in a process whereby they were alleging that uh, the government, that is uh, PNU, the Party of National Unity, was uh, planning to rig the elections by using some members of the administration police force. And uh, a number of SMSs actually were circulated around indicating that uh, these APs were being trained at uh, the Embakasi training uh, unit and they had been ferried using city hopper buses across the country. And uh, due to the high levels or the, the stakes that are being held in the, the current or the, the elections that you're expecting tomorrow, there's a lot of anger. And uh, as a result, uh, a number of administration policemen were actually being transported to various parts of the country to participate in the elections. And uh, unfortunately, they Topi, became the uh, victims. Topi Liambila, uh, is uh, uh, President Kibaki fighting Kibaki. for his political life here? Well, definitely he is, and uh, basically what we are hearing about this question of, uh, you know, uh, people being trained, the APs being trained in Embakasi, I think what has lent credence to the uh, belief that, you know, probably these people could be used to manipulate or to rig elections is the fact that, you know, before that, we would expect that, you know, in a world of transparency, in a world of today, that, you know, we would expect that... Uh, the government would have been open to the press, even invited the press to Embakasi, so that they see the efforts that the government is putting in to prepare for the elections. Then this would not have been any, it wouldn't have been overtaken by this uh, rumor mongering and propaganda. But are you, saying that, uh, are you saying that there is solid evidence that uh, to some extent things are rigged? 
Well, no, I'm try I'm not trying to say that you know, some excellent things are rigged, but you see, when you do things that raise eyebrows, like when you find that, you know, uh, the bus is ferrying the same policeman, uh, private buses owned by, you know, an individual who is uh, part of the presidential uh, team, then people are bound to begin thinking, what's happening? Because Stephen, we have got government vehicles. All right, I'd like to bring in uh, Stephen Kabera Karanja. Sorry for interrupting you. I want to bring in Stephen Kabera Karanja in uh, Oslo. Mr. Karanja, tribal loyalty, we've heard a lot about it in Kenya, over 40 main tribes in Kenya. Is it still the key factor in determining the outcome of these elections? Uh, unfortunately, I think it is the key uh, factor that is going to determine these elections. And it is uh, a setback, I think, for Kenya that it should be uh, dealing with the uh, issues of tribalism at this stage because they are very important issues, economic issues, uh, democracy, uh, democratic issues, and other issues that should be dealt with and should be the focus. But it seems that we cannot, uh, our political elite cannot mobilize without mobilizing their tribal uh, centers. And this is going to determine, because as we can see now, when we see most of the polls, we see that every, every presidential candidate is being supported by his uh, uh, political legion. The political constituency that he has is a tribal constituency, and it's the one that is supporting him. So I think, yes, it's going to be determined by uh, ethnic alliances, ethnic uh, loyalty in this election. The issues of corruption, of course, they are very important issues, but still they are being dealt with from a very partisan issues and partisan, partisan outlook. We require them to be dealt from a national outlook where people show their uh, patriotism not only to, to, the, to those who are corrupt in the other side, but also those who are corrupt in their side. Topi Liambila, interesting that Raila Odinga has joined 15 political parties throughout his political career. How revealing is that into his personality, considering that people are saying that he's the favorite? Well, I, I believe, you know, like, you know, when you move from party to party, basically it just uh, shows, you know, your vibrance. And, uh, well, basically, you know, the reason should be more like why he has moved from point A to B and not, why, uh, not, not, not you know, he is going, going from point A to B. Because there are reasons, you know, which uh, dictate a person's decision to move from one party to another. For instance, coming into the Orange Democratic Party, from the from the coalition, NAC coalition, living NAC coalition, he was sacked from the NAC coalition after the referendum in uh, 2005, and basically what he did, you know, he had to find ground, and that's why they formulated the you, you know the Orange Democratic Movement, and uh, you know, parties I think are not really a key issue here. The issue here is a question of you know like you know when those parties are overtaken, like my colleague has said, uh, when they are overtaken by those tribal tendencies, that is when it's a problem. Or else, having more parties just, you know, it just emphasizes, re-emphasizes the, the, the democratic principles of a state. And I think the more, the more parties there are, it just shows that, you know, people are being democratic and people want to express, you know, their democratic uh, allegiances. Interesting mentioning those parties. Rachel Odengo, the Orange Democratic Movement did split into two. How strong are the two ODMs in relation to each other? Okay, um, in comparison, I think um, the ODM, the Orange Democratic Movement, has uh, proved to be a very strong party. Uh, actually, looking from or judging from the recent opinion polls, it's that the ODM has emerged to be an even more stronger party than the ODM Kenya. But one is because of the, its leadership uh, and the, the spread across the country. We see that uh, one issue I had one of actually one of my the, of the fellow contributors touching on tribalism. But I think uh, just to mention actually that tribalism I don't think is it's going to really play a key in in this in these elections. In that one thing we know that Kenya has come actually a long stride since uh, independence to maybe the year 2002, and a lot of civic education has taken place, making 
Kenyans more aware of what they want, their rights, and what their political leaders should actually stand for. And as a result, and I think uh, Raila has really come out evidently to try and show people that he's a man of principle, he's a man who really believes in his word, and he will not entertain anything that will go against his wishes or of uh, that of the people. As a result, he's actually set a platform whereby he's been able to market himself and the party to the populace in a manner in which he actually connects majorly with a majority of the poor people, making him to become more likable and as a result the party becoming even more popular in, in the ground. And as it stands right now, ODM party is very, very popular on the ground than the ODM Kenya. And actually, the polls also showed, showed us that even the party of national unity was even more popular than the ODM uh, Kenya party because people tend to view the ODM Kenya as uh, a tribal uh, party whereby it's mainly MPs aligned from one community that form a majority of the people who hold stake in that party. Well, well interesting. I'm result, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, talking about alliance, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I want to bring in Mr. Karanja in Oslo. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, leader of the former ruling party, is a recent ally of Mwai Kibaki, along with former President Daniel Arap Mwai. Uh, how significant do you think is that? Well, from a question of votes, I don't think that's going to be very significant for Kibaki, because Kibaki already had the Kikuyu block vote. So, and also knowing that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta comes from the Kikuyu, then I don't think that uh, this would change, and uh, arithmetically would change the votes that Kibaki were going to get from the central province, which is dominantly Kikuyu. But the fact that uh, Kanu has also uh, members and it, it has strong base in the Rift Valley, that could have changed the, the fortunes for Kibaki. And, but I don't know how, how far this is going to do, because Kibaki also has brought in uh, Moi, Moi, the former president, as uh, his uh, uh, supporter. And this could have uh, uh, bad, uh, bad effects, perhaps, for, for Kibaki. But if he uh, would be able to convince his Kalenjin bloc within the Lifty Valley that uh, they should vote for, uh, for, for Kibaki for, so as to continue what he has been doing, then that could also bring a lot of votes for Kibaki. But this has yet to be seen what influence still President, uh, the former president, uh, uh, Daniel Apmoy, has within he his uh, strong base of Lifty Valley. We have uh, uh, All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you now because we need to take a break. So we need to take a break. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this after the break. Stay with us in London, Oslo and Nairobi. Time for that break. When we come back, we discuss the main challenges that will face Kenya's next president. Stay with us.